Welcome, welcome, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Welcome, welcome. And uh, please go ahead and uh, let us know um, where you are logging and joining in from, where in the world you are, and where you are in your professional journey. So go ahead. Welcome, welcome. Okay. We are being live streamed to YouTube for anyone who has trouble finding us. Um, so welcome. Welcome, welcome. So go ahead and in the chat, let us know where you're from. Oh, awesome. Chelsea's coming from Oxnard. Oh my God, that's right up the street from me. Um, Clover, South Carolina. LPCC, LPC in Chicago. Thanks for joining us. Oh, I love to see the LPCs. Hello. Um, uh, joining us for this. Um, I know it's about MFT, but I, uh, I think it's relevant to everyone. Tokyo. Oh my God. Los Angeles, North Carolina, Van Nuys, Milwaukee, Albuquerque, Swayze, Indiana, CSUN. Woohoo. My students are here. Hawaii, aloha, aloha, Indonesia, Colorado, San Jose, holy moly, awesome, uh, Spring Arbor, oh my god, that went so fast I couldn't see it, Florida, Westlake Village, woohoo, hi Chris, it's my neighbor, a former graduate too, Shelby, North Carolina, awesome, awesome, Connecticut, welcome, welcome everyone, Olympia, San Maria, so welcome. I am just so happy to have you here and I am so excited about today's um, webinar. I'm looking like that, it look, looks a little crooked there, huh? So um, yes, because today we are going to be talking about social justice and family therapy. And today's lecture is a, um, based on really the hardest thing I've ever written in my life, which is chapter three in the fourth edition of Mastering Competencies in Family Therapy. And I'm going to tell you why it was the hardest literature review I've written in my entire life. Um, but I am just thrilled to be here and to share this with you. We have a lot of material to get through in the next 20 minutes. Um, so I want to go ahead and get started. And if you have questions for me, for, for those of you who are watching this live, um, I will be taking um, I will be taking questions at the end, and so you can put those in the Q and A. As you can see already, we got lots of comments in the chat, so you can talk with each other in the chat. And the Q and A though is where I will go through those to answer questions at the end. So um, let's go ahead and get started. So. Um, I want to start this off because this will uh, this um, recording this um, will eventually live on YouTube, and so I want to just start off here that I'm really trying to invite everyone to have a different type of conversation today. Um, I know, it, you know, I'm based in the United States. We have had a lot of polarizing conversations, discourses uh, right now at this time in history. This is being filmed in uh, 2022. 2023, excuse me. Um, I really do know what year it is. And, and and so social justice has been a topic that has been very polarizing. And I want everyone, I'm going to invite everyone to, um, as you put comments either on YouTube or in this uh, webinar today, to think about phrasing uh, things in such a way that helps to depolarize. Because both in the United States and in countries around the world, this is not just a problem here. Um, so many nations are experiencing um, forms of polarization that are hurting everyone involved. And, and so we need to find better ways to move forward um, together and to reconnect with one another. And so um, as you post your comments, I invite you to use language that really um, helps reconnect all of us with our innate sense of humanity and compassion. And it really comes down to how we relate to one another is how we heal all of our communities, countries, um, discourses um, to really create a better world for everyone involved. And I really believe that's possible. I know not everyone does, but I do hold out hope for humanity. Um, and really trying to move these difficult conversations forward in, in positive directions is really my goal here. 
That said, so um, anyone who's been in any of my classes, you will know that there is a policy of kindness. So, you know, we I want any posted comments here to really be supportive and uplifting. And if there are any hateful, disparaging comments uh, specifically on YouTube, I will take those down. So uh, with that said, I just in case anyone had to, you know, visit this, I just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, I also wanted to just start with this kind of somewhat disclaimer um, that for every complex problem, which I believe social justice is, there are answers that are clear, simple, and wrong. And so um, this video, I am, my task is really to just outline the contours of social justice dialogue in family therapy at this particular point in time. And all of this was actually written in summer of 2022. So already this is a year out of date. That's how textbooks work. They take a long time to uh, get to press. And, you know, you know, there are no simple answers here. There are a lot of complex um, conversations and topics. And so my job here is to start outlining those for you, for everyone who is listening here to deepen um, our reflections and to hopefully plant seeds that are going to help you do really great things in this world to help your clients um, navigate, I think, some of life's most difficult challenges. So real briefly, our agenda is going to be I'm going to just start by even giving a context to this whole lecture because it is based on and designed to go with, you know, my textbooks. But what is a textbook? What ends up in it? How do things get there? A lot of people, I think, don't understand that. And I just thought it might be useful to even start there to understand the whole context of what I am presenting here. Um, we'll talk very, very briefly about the historical foundations of social justice in family therapy, some of the earliest works. Um, we're going to just touch on some of the key terminology and frameworks, and then we are going to do a very quick tour um, of the of the, some of the leading models in the field. And um, I got ten or twelve of those to march through, so I'm not going to be going like totally in depth. Um, and then finally, just where to go from here on your journey. Okay. And I also just want to start by just sharing a little bit about me. I think like many of you, I have never fit, um, fit into a box. And as we start talking about social justice and social location, uh, there are a lot of boxes involved. Um, I have lived in many contexts and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I'm just going to say I have a lot of, of the experience of living in a lot of different sociocultural contexts. I am white appearing in a white dominant culture. I have lived as a visible minority as a person of color in a white dominant um, context. It's true. That's a whole other a webinar we could go into. I've been a visible um, a minority appearing white in a non-white culture. So I, I've, I've lived, um, I've lived in different and had very different experiences that have really shaped and helped shape me. And I hope all of you get to have some experiences similar to this to really kind of live some of what we are going to be talking about, because none of it is easy. It is not fun. It is very complex. Things are not always what they appear. Um, and so, so just knowing that as we begin this conversation, we all um, come to this work from life experiences that shape how we understand what we're about to talk about today. I've also lived in gender non-conforming contexts, and I can tell you there are dimensions of diversity I don't even think the field has begun to discuss that are very personally important to me. Those are books I have yet to write. Um, but so what we're talking today is a very complex phenomenon, and I just wanted to start by sharing some of my basic assumptions I have when I meet others, is that each one of us is shaped by many different culturally informed discourses related to so many different um, dimensions of being human. And I mean, in this presentation, this whole, you know, this, uh, what we look at the literature in family therapy, uh, in terms of social justice, we are just touching on a handful, you know, we maybe get up to eight to 10, I think, there is still so much more even that the field has not even begun to discuss or reflect on. 
There's only, when I meet my clients, there's only a handful of these I can see on the surface. There are so many more I know that I cannot see. And I also know there's so many um, more dimensions of their lived experience that I can't even guess how those have affected them. And so, um, and I, I also think there are many dimensions of our experience that our clients can't even yet articulate, may not even be fully conscious of. Um, and I also, um, so, so given this context, I really try to meet my clients from a place of utmost compassion, kindness, and humility, knowing there is so much I do not understand. And so my guiding principle really is, how are my words and interactions with my clients helping to reconnect each of us more deeply with our own sense of humanity, for understanding what it means to be human more fully, and every client I meet, I am humbled. I learn more about this, what is possible in the human experience and the human journey. And so I share this with you as a place to start that I don't know it all. <laughs> I don't pretend to know it all. I've not experienced it all. Um, but I come to this work um, with a sense of humanity and um, compassion and humility. And I invite you to do the same. It is um, sometimes scary. Sometimes unnerving, um, but it really is a life transforming journey um, to do this work in this way. Okay, so where did this presentation come from? It, it has come um, from the work of the, wow, I spelled fourth wrong there, um, the fourth edition of Mastering Competencies, um, which was released in April, 2023. The, this chapter that was actually written in the summer of 2022, and pretty much if it wasn't published by May 2022, it is not in this chapter. Um, but I did include and add an entire chapter on social justice and family therapy with this book. If you're interested, you can get the paperback from most any book retailer. If you want to rent the book, the ebook, just so you know, does have videos embedded in it. And you can get all the free forms that go with this book. There are free clinical forms. I think there are almost 18 of them that go with the book at therapythatworksinstitute.com slash books. Um, you can get all of the forms for the other chapters. So that is, so it comes from, it's, a, it's the kind of online lecture that goes with chapter three for this book. Because so I want to talk about what a textbook is. A textbook is a secondary source, and those of you who are in graduate school or remember graduate school, uh, many of your professors may say, you may not use secondary sources in your uh, papers, because a secondary source summarizes primary sources, so the original wor written works of others. And so when you're doing academic writing, this is really important to, to, to understand, because most of what's in a textbook is secondary. I say all of this, and then I know my textbooks have treatment plans that are published nowhere else. So in that case, those little segments of the book can be considered primary because there's no one else to actually cite. Um, but if you're reading a textbook and I'm summarizing Salvador Mnuchin's, you know, structural family therapy, you should be citing him, not me. Do not give me credit for developing structural family therapy, please. I appreciate it, but yeah, it's not how it works. So my job as a textbook author is to identify what's going on in the literature in the field and put it into a book, summarize it for students um, to kind of get the Reader's Digest version to understand and hopefully explain, you know, some of these concepts in more contemporary ways. A lot of what I do in my books is to try to take some literature that might be 60 years old and translate it for contemporary audiences. It's real important when a textbook author is writing to really avoid adding bias and opinion. And, and I, I really do. You'll get more of my opinion in this uh, online lecture than you will in the book because you're allowed to do that in a lecture. It's hard to do that. But I'm actually, I, I think that really, I take it as a very um, sacred type of contract between me and everyone else in the field that I am presenting um, the original, the ideas of others with as few filters as humanly possible. Um, you know, that said, there's also, you know, just who gets included and who doesn't, and we'll talk about that. And I would try to be very clear about who got into this chapter and who didn't, because this is the most difficult literature review I've ever written. 
Um, but I use the existing literature to guide what goes in and what doesn't. So what are most people saying are the most important theories in the field or the leading theories? And that's how ideas end up in textbooks. But I'm always following the whole, it's a breadcrumb trail. The literature review is always this breadcrumb trail. It's my job to follow that, summarize it, and then put it in a book that um, especially new professionals can get a nice introduction to the field. And I want to also remind you, um, especially anyone watching um, this video in the future, that any textbook is really just a snapshot in time. And so in, in this case, um, Mastering Competencies fourth edition is a snapshot of, you know, the literature base in the summer of 2022, even though the book gets published in 23. And that the field is constantly evolving. And I think of all my chapters, this social justice one, this particular, you know, what I'm saying today in five years, I know the field will dramatically be transformed. And so, because um, the knowledge is always evolving. And in the area of social justice, I would say as a textbook author, it evolves faster than all the other chapters in this book. And so some of the, especially the terminology. And so what was an accepted terminology um, you know, eight years ago when I did the third edition was, is not an accepted terminology, you know, in the fourth, uh, edition. And so I say that as just a disclaimer that it's my job to use the terminology of the primary, you know, authors and, you know, and that this is going to change. I've had people, you know, email me saying, you know, why are you using transgendered? We don't use that term anymore. And I said, I know, but when I wrote the book 10 years ago, that's the primary author, that's what they were using. And that was an accepted term back then. And it's not anymore. And I don't know what the accepted terminology is gonna be for a lot of what we're discussing today in another 10 years. And so just knowing, um, especially those of you who are new to the field that, that you know, being a professional, our knowledge base is constantly evolving. Uh, accepted terminology is constantly evolving. You know, so, you know, it's kind of exciting. We're part of this living development, a creation of knowledge as a community, which also means that things do get outdated, you know, over time. And so just keeping that in, in mind when you read any textbook or even when you go back and you read literature, the original literature from the field from 60, 70 years ago, there are a lot of things um, in the original sources that would not be accepted today. And that's just part of how knowledge evolves. So let's talk about literature review and rhizomes. So in virtually every other text uh, chapter of, my, of all of my textbooks, um, there is this really clear breadcrumb trail I can follow. So for example, if I'm, you know, um, you know in my, my section of my chapter on you know, Virginia Satir's work, you know, I can start with her original work. She had about five major books. I summarize all of those. I can, the people who come after her, I can, you know, summarize what comes after that. It's this really clear breadcrumb trail that moves across time. And so my job has always been find that the, the beginning thread, you know, find that first breadcrumb and, you know, which is usually pretty easy. What's the first thing Virginia Satir, you know, published and go from there. And it's, you know, really, really easy. But boy, when I came to do this chapter, there was no breadcrumb trail. So there is something, uh, rhizomes are um, a type of root system in nature, like bamboo here, where there's no single stem. And what's happening is just this horizontal rootstock that lots of shoots come up in different places. So bamboo, ginger, I think aspen trees have these rhizomatic root structures. And in philosophy, there is something called rhizomatic knowledge. They talk about in post-structuralism, a school under postmodernism, where there's no linear network of ideas. And that there are a lot of different people in different places at different times who may or may not know each other, independently developing similar ideas. And that certainly captures the world of social justice um, and family therapy, and I would say in all of the different um, schools of psychotherapy, that there isn't one single first this idea happened, then this idea, and then this idea. Like every other chapter in my books, and virtually every other chapter in any textbook, 
has a very, has a clear linear development of the ideas. And that is not true when it comes to social justice. And so there are all of these different people working in different places um, on these ideas, some talking with each other, some not. And so it's a very, very difficult um, literature review for those of you who have volunteered to present on this to your classes or write a paper on this in grad school. I I'm sorry, I'm giving you the news. This was the hardest chapter to uh, write a literature review on. And, but if it makes you feel any better, it's the hardest thing I've ever had to write in my life. I consulted with many of the experts whose work I will be summarizing and I'm like, okay, so there's no clear development the thread here because I can't find it. They're like, yep, nope, nope, rhizomatic. I'm like, okay, it's a rhizome, I got it, got it. And then it's like, how do I even decide what to put in and put out? And I will tell you how I made some of those decisions as we go along. Um, but for those of you who are writing a paper on this in graduate school, it, yeah, it's not just you. It is probably the toughest literature review you'll ever write. So let's go ahead and look at some of the historical foundations of social justice in family therapy. And this is going to be super brief. I just want to touch on some of the major highlights. So um, early MFT history. So the early system, uh, systemic foundations in family therapy, I, I think are really fascinating. And you'll see some of these, uh, like I said, in chapters two, four, and six of the fourth edition of family therapy. But family therapy um, really uh, you know, developed out of the world. One of the main thinkers who informed the development of family therapy was Gregory Bateson. And Bateson was not a psychologist. He's, I think, one of the most, uh, of all the different schools of psychotherapy, family therapy has this very interesting beginning with an anthropologist who was studying actually uh, tribal groups and tribal interactions in New Guinea and, and looking at how social systems create homeostasis. And so that's really um, the beginning. And so I think it's very fascinating that family therapy started here. And the truth is, <laughs> Since then, it was, what's strange is that it very much largely ignored culture, gender, social class, and larger social systems in the early years of family therapy, even though it has that anthropological, anthropological beginning um, in the field. And we've, we're just slowly kind of getting back to it. And if you look at some of the, the work of early family therapists um, in terms of social justice, I, in my opinion, the ones I found the most literature on, um, you will see that there's the Women's Project, which was a group of intergenerational therapists that are summarized in chapter nine, uh, many of them kind of working in a Bowen intergenerational approach. And they really began to highlight um, gender issues in families and gender equity. And so that those are some of the first voices there. And then when, if you look at structural family therapy, um, you know, one of Salvador's um, Mnuchin's early works really focused on poverty, working with very diverse families in Philadelphia, um, with several other, you know, of his colleagues. Um, and I, this is summarized in chapter seven of the book. So there, there was some, but really not a lot of emphasis. I think the focus is really trying to understand how to um, help couples and families change in the early years um, in the field. And it's not till we get to the postmodern therapies where we really begin to um, have social justice really become more of a center focus integrated into daily work. Um, you have collaborative therapy, um, which really focuses on social constructionism. And then, of course, narrative therapy that has a social constructionism, but also brings in Foucault, critical theory, and um, taking a much closer look at dominant discourses and how they affect an individual's experience of um, whatever problems are going on in their life. And so, so today, you know, we're talking about um, social justice and family therapy, but I want to just highlight that throughout the book, there are other places where you will see this. And in particular, these are some of the, the most um, impactful, I, I, I think, highlights of the early history of the field. And those of you who are familiar with some of my work, you know that I have created a unifying framework for psychotherapy that actually, it has these eight levels and I just want to highlight that all of this work on social justice 
um, that we're going to be talking about today, that it really aligns very closely with what we would call the postmodern therapies, narrative, collaborative, um, feminist, social justice approaches. And it's just this very top part of kind of the, um, the framework that we have here, where when you look at things like, um, you know, cognitive behavioral you know, they do have, there's that focus on the behavioral levels and cognitive levels. And when you work from an approach, whether it's, you know, CBT, family system, psychodynamic, humanistic, you're, you know, these approaches don't necessarily have built into them considerations of social justice. So that is something that the clinician is going to need to bring into um, these approaches where it's more the postmodern has this built in um, to their kind of default case conceptualization way of looking at what's going on. So only the most recent development, I would say, in um, the therapy models um, is a consideration of social justice um, kind of built in at the ground level, where with most other approaches, you're going to have to go back and add to it. So um, I'm going to look at some of the just quickly highlight um, some of the work of the early pioneers and how you ended up on this list. I'm very clear in my book because there are many, many people who brought their um, who did early work here. But these are the folks who wrote some of the most influential books. It's a very arbitrary kind of description of what's important and what's not. What's hard also, if you try to write a literature review on social justice, is that so much of the literature is about someone's individual lived experience. And that's a very hard thing to summarize and put into a textbook, I'll tell you that. Um, so, so what I looked at were who, who has either pulled together collections of voices or have written, you know, major early works in the field. So this is just some of those highlights. It's not everyone who was important, um, but Celia Falikov was a very early advocate of cultural awareness, um, working and especially highlighting uh, her work with a Latino and Latinx, Latina communities. Um, so she was certainly one of the early voices. Uh, Kenneth Hardy, um, his work also, he's done a ton of work in bringing awareness to social justice issues, especially around the areas of race, working with black communities. Then we have Nancy Boyd uh, Franklin, who also, she wrote one of the first books on the experiences of black families. Monica McGoldrick is uh, definitely one of the leading um, thinkers in this area. She has a book called Ethnicity and Family Therapy that describes extensive descriptions of um, family systems and how they work in you know, for over 40 different ethnicities. It's really an invaluable um, resource when you're working with um, clients from, you know, especially families from different backgrounds. Um, Lori Charlet, she is a leader in the area of global and international family therapy. Then we have Muditha uh, Rastogi, who um, does has done a ton of work in culturally informed couple and family therapy, as well as you'll be hearing about her global family therapy model that we'll be talking about. Um, Carmen Knudsen Martin is another a leader in the field, um, writing both about uh, gender equality and equity, as well as socially attuned family therapy, uh, along with her Teresa McDowell, who um, has worked on bringing a lot of post structural and critical theory into the field. And then we have Maria um, Bermudez, who um, has looked at culturally appropriate applications with Latinx families, as well as culturally informed research um, methods. And then we also have Aria Almeida, who looks at social justice and decolonizing practices, and we'll be talking about her uh, cultural context model. So these are just some of the folks who have written some of the most influential influential books in the field. This is certainly not a comprehensive list of any of everyone in the field who has contributed to this incredible discourse, you know, conversations in the professional literature um, in family therapy related to um, social justice. I want to go ahead and just kind of go through, I think most of you hopefully know these terms, but I'm going to just go ahead and make sure you, um, you know, we start with some of the basic terminology um, so that we all start from a similar place. So first, um, you will hear quite often people talk about intersectionality. And this is the concept of that all of our different um, identity 
classifications. So gender, race, ethnicity, um, religion, all of these, they're not isolated from one another. They intersect, you know, so looking at how our gender you know, uh, ethnicity, social economic class, level of education, age, ability, all of these, they intersect in very unique ways. And that's why when I said, you know, when I meet someone, I assume nothing. I, I have to understand how all of these threads of identity have come together inside of them. There's no simple classification, you know, and the paradox is there's always this juxtaposition. We still need to understand some of those um, classifications, but then at the same time, be able to let go of those and understand our client's unique experience, knowing that there's so many variables and, and threads of identity that come together that shape how they experience themselves. There is this concept of social location you will hear, which is really like considering a person within the much broader context of their intersectional, intersectionality. And so when we talk about your social location, it's about all of the different dimensions of your sense of identity, cultural, cultural influences that help you define that who you who you are, how you see yourself and, and your social and how you fit into this broader social location. You will hear the term cultural competence, and this means having the knowledge to work with people across various cultures. Like I said, things change all the time. <laughs> you know, 10 years ago, cultural competence was widely used um, and generally considered, you know, cutting edge, positive term to use. It has already fallen out of favor. It is currently not the preferred term because it kind of implies there's a certain point at which you become competent, you know, about cultures. And, you know, hopefully if there's one thing you get from this whole lecture is that there's no such place. Like it, it's a lifetime journey, understanding yourself and others. There's not a certain point where you get it all. You can check the box. I'm culturally competent. I don't need to worry about this stuff anymore. That, that never happens. So that said, uh, you know, people will use it and, and that can be fine, but it is a less favored term. Um, the moment a preferred term is cultural humidity, humility. I don't know if in 10 years this will be preferred. Who knows? It'll probably be a replaced, you know, preferred term. And so I'm highlighting this so that, especially in the area of social justice, terminology is con constantly evolving rapidly. And so that's just something to be aware of. So that there is this uh, culture of humility is really about having a set of values and ongoing pr practice of ongoing personal reflection and being respectful of, of how you relate to others and knowing that there's so much you don't know, you can't even imagine what you don't know. And I don't even think the field has even begun even exploring all the dimensions um, of diversity and human experience. And so just realizing how much you don't know is what, what, what it, when they're referring to cultural humility and that helps you engage your clients um, from a much more open perspective, a much more um, curious perspective and being very careful in terms of how you proceed. And, you know, I, you, this can never be overstated. You know, for example, I have a client who, you know, um, I have a client who, if you were to look at them, you would think this is, you know, definitely someone who probably identifies as non-binary. You know, I should probably ask their, you know, pronouns. This is someone who's, you know, really spent their whole life kind of moving through. I've been with them through various, you know, uh, identities in the LGBTQ world, their experience. And, but that's not how they identify at all. And I, you know, she is a she. And, and that's exactly how she experiences herself. And she, you know, gets very frustrated that everyone who meets her has to ask pronouns. And that's the standard greeting now and, and has this whole other unexpected, you know, experience. So no matter what a person looks like, at what time in history, you, you know, proceeding with humility, not assuming. Um, and so as you, as you remain humble, you will be humbled. People will correct you. <laughs> and 
if you can do that gracefully, it normally goes well, but to, you, you know, all I can say is never assume anything, always ask open-ended questions and be curious because you just, you just don't know from what you're seeing on the outside, how someone, what, what their, what their identity is on the inside. And equality um, is a term you'll hear and it's contrasted with equity. So equality is when you treat everybody equally. And as you may probably have heard this term, but equity is really about not how, do, you know, if you, if everyone kind of started from a different place, you know, equity is focusing and that's equality is assuming everyone is starting from a similar place. And so everyone can be treated equally where equity is really about the state of being fair and just. And so when we look at um, various cultural groups, let's say in the United States, um, to, you know, to create equity is a very different thing than focusing on equality and treating everyone equal. And the truth is there are no simple, <laughs> uh, simple answers here. We see this a lot in the realm of education, um, both K through 12 and at college you know, levels in terms of equality versus creating equity. And it is, it is, there are no simple answers, but understanding that when we're looking at equity is recognizing that people start in different places. You know, if you're coming from parents who don't have a high school education, right? How do they, how are they competing equally <laughs> with some, with parent, with, with someone who comes from a family that does? And so looking at these and how do we create a more fair and just society? I think it is an ever evolving struggle, but it's one that we need to come to the table with um, open minds and hearts to try to find um, equitable ways of moving forward. So people do experience equality of some kind. So there's, um, it's a very difficult, um, journey with, uh, again, there aren't simple ways to answer all of those questions. Another common term you will hear in the social justice uh, discourses is around the term privilege, which refers to either social biological identifiers that give an individual special advantages within their given community. And so it can be economic, cultural, or social capital. And the one thing that's really interesting is as within different contexts, different people um, you can experience privilege in one context and not in another. And so I, I think uh, I, I uh, teach in family therapy programs and, you know, uh, historically our programs have been 90% female. Actually, most recently we were up to, we were down to 80% female. And so a lot of men in our programs experience suddenly not being in what would be considered generally a privileged position because of the how the gender dynamics shift. And so we have fun conversations um, just reflecting on that, but being aware that just because a person is privileged in one context within their culture, it, it doesn't necessarily translate and it can go all different directions. For example, when my students um, I work in the Los Angeles area, so many of my students are bi uh, bilingual, bicultural, Spanish speaking and in LA, um, when you go for a job search, you know, Spanish speaking is highly prized. You know, I have to coach my students. I'm like, you do realize you are in a very privileged position, you know, in the sense of how do you, you know, um, negotiate your job contracts. And so even teaching people to embrace that in different contexts, or obviously not in every context are they experiencing that. So also being aware of how the experience of quote unquote privilege or just this social advantage, I think might be a good word for it as well how that can even shift in different contexts and helping our clients be aware of that as well. Because I have worked with a lot of folks when they are in a, in a position in a particular social context where they may have more influence, power or benefits or advantages, even knowing how to use that. And so under kind of being able to just track this and realize it's not a, 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 an all or nothing black and white thing and that in different contexts, um, privilege can ebb and flow. So we are now, I'm gonna now move into an overview of some of the leading social justice um, uh, models in family therapy. And I'm gonna call this a rhizomatic review. I kind of do like that word, that's all I have to say. Okay. So 
Um, I'm going to start off with socio-culturally attuned family therapy. And so this is the, based on the work of McDowell, Knudsen Martin, and Bermudez. They have an incredible book. It's in its second edition. That is, um, the book's title is Socioculturally Attuned Family Therapy. And it looks at, it looks at all the different therapeutic models and how to work in a more socioculturally attuned way. Um, but the, the overarching model is recognizing the connection and effects between social and relational power dynamics, especially when you're working in um, with couples and families. These um, social and relational dynamics definitely play out in the family system and couple systems and being able to identify and attend to those. And so there's this relational focus in terms of looking at individuals, couples, families, but within the broader social context that they are in and being able to name those um, and understanding how these are so central to the client's lives, organizing both our individual identities and very much organizing our relationships, our family and couple relationships. And I would add to this, I don't know if they say this, but I would add that oftentimes very unaware. Um, you know, when I work with couples and families, you know, I always say as soon as you, you know, go from being, um, you know, individuals to getting married, all of these usually, you know, social discourses from our families and our um, cultural context, you know, as you get those labels of um, married, you know, husband, wife, right? All of these um, often unaware, uh, uh, these uh, discourses that we're often unaware of and often will say, oh, I don't ascribe to that. You start acting those out. The same thing happens often when you have your first, your children, that again, this whole set of family of origin and cultural discourses come into play that you may or may not even be aware of. Um, and so, so they're really working on um, this whole approach is how do we bring this awareness um, to our work, um, particularly with couples and families, or just working even with individuals with these couple family lenses that we have. And so there are four elements of this core practice. Um, and so this is the first element is really about a relational focus that and looking at how we are being with our clients in relationship. So using a collaborative um, rather than a hierarchical approach and really building um, sincere, humane uh, relationships and really looking at how we are with our clients, not kind of coming off as this expert who knows everything, but being able to come in and walk side by side to understand our client's world, walking with them side by side. Then they have this concept that I just love called third order thinking. Um, if you're familiar with family therapy, you know, there's first order, second order, you know, thinking and problems. And now we have third order, which is looking at the larger social um, systems that we are embedded in, these social structures and how they inform what we identify as a problem, what we experience as a problem, how we experience as our problems. But I think even more importantly, what are the potential solutions? What, what, what are the possibilities we have moving forward? But understanding how these broader social contexts are interacting with our experience of both the problems and potential solutions. And then the third element here is what they call as responsibility towards equity. And that means um, what they're saying is that the clinician, the therapist has um, a responsibility to help move clients towards more equitable relationships. So looking at the dominant cultural frameworks and practices that create inequality and intentionally addressing these. And I would say they do it in a way that is still relationally focused. It is still collaborative, but um, bringing awareness to this in a way that isn't shaming or demeaning. It's one of the things I love about this work, um, but really helping people open and reflect on some of these differences. And so really also focusing on the nuance attention to context. So understanding a client's very specific cultural context, how their family immigrated, how they fit in um, or don't to the local 
communities that they're a part of, um, and really understanding the nuances of the client's unique experience um, at a very, very subtle level. You know, just saying someone, you know, is from a Latinx, Latina, Latino culture, you know, there is so much diversity <laughs> within those various communities. And there's the language and immigration. You don't know anything, just having that label. There's just so many subtle, subtle parts, what neighborhood they're a part of, you know, education, all of those things. So there's a lot of complexity and the socioculturally attuned family therapy framework is inviting clinicians to really slow down, be curious, ask questions, um, to understand the nuances of their client's experience, because there really is, none of us fit neatly into any of these boxes, okay? And so um, bringing that curiosity, and I, I, would, I would add slowing down often to really understand how your client experiences these things. They um, use the ANVIET uh, guidelines for socioculturally attuned practice and ANVIET, I'm not even sure if that's correct pronunciation. Uh, these are the guidelines. So when you're working with clients, one is attuning to the context and power. So, you know, being aware of, you know, how you present in the room, um, where your clients are in relation to the ship to that, where, what kind of agency or setting are you in um, for the for the family or couple? What might be the you know different contextual and or power variables there? You know, even just you know looking at um, gender and how that plays out in the room. Um, the next thing is naming what is unjust, and and this is when as your clients are talking about their lived experiences especially for you, because you are the person with the most power in the room as the clinician, if when you name what is unjust, and you don't have to do it in an all-knowing way, I think you should still bring curiosity, you know, but even just saying, do you think, you know, race is part of, you know, race was part of the dynamics that played out here, you know, at work or at home, or do you think gender is part of these dynamics, that, you know, that you just described, and oftentimes you can see people just be relieved Oh, I can talk about that here with you. Um, it's it's very relieving. So typically, it is our job to bring that up, um, and to and normally I I ask if they if they see that as a potential dynamic first because I want to hear how they're understanding it and seeing it first rather than even cramming my, my interpretation down their throat or imposing my interpretation on them. I usually do that. Um, but it's extremely rare that someone rejects it if I'm willing to name it. Um, valuing what is minimized. And so often people who come from marginalized identities and experiences, you know, valuing, um, um, finding the value, naming that value, pointing it out um, can be incredibly uplifting, liberating, and healing for people. So, you know, um, you know, let's say, um, you, you know, you're, you're working with a client where maybe, you know, English wasn't the main language spoken, spoken at home. And so being able to find value in that, naming that, pointing it out, looking at all of the benefits maybe that came from that can be very, very empowering for a client. So intervening to support equality and disrupt power dynamics, I will tell you, um, when you're working with a couple or a family and there is, um, you know, equity and power disparities that the easiest thing for us to do, and we do this, I think, very unconsciously, is to ask the person typically with lesser power to make more of the changes because that is the dominant way things work, you know, in our culture. So if you're working with a heterosexual couple, for example, and you, you have a male in the family, let's say a breadwinner and a homemaker. So you have someone making money now, you have them male, you have a, a female who's home taking care of the kids. There's a huge power disparity there. And the truth is, it's generally going to be easier to get the female homemaker to make changes to stabilize the relationship than it will be the man. That's typically how it will, will play out. And so 
Um, and on our job here is to be able to identify that, to really look for equity in creating equity and equality in these relationships. Because we do know that, you know, um, relationships where the power is more evenly distributed, both parties are happier, even if they don't think they're going to be at the beginning sometimes. Um, so, so when they're saying to intervene to support equality and disrupt those power dynamics, it's being able to identify them, right? <laughs> and then intervene in such a way that you're not reinforcing power disparities, which is generally going to be your instinct. So this actually, I think, takes a lot of intentionality. Um, envisioning just alternatives. So working, especially with couples and families, where a lot of injustice can happen, uh, especially in couple family work. And so helping, helping the couples and families and individuals who are in relationships envision more just alternatives, ways of moving forward. And sometimes that can be really hard to envision. Let's say I, I, I see this most around gender roles. Just envisioning that can be a real uh, challenge for some. And, and so helping them come up with believable future visions of how these relationships can be negotiated in more equitable ways. So transformation, which is making what is imagined real and helping um, our clients enact these more equitable um, ways of relating with one another. Okay. So next, moving on, we're going to talk about the social construction of us versus them. So this is based on the work of my colleagues at uh, San Diego State University. Uh, Gerald Monk, well, I guess John, John, I think is it God, San Bernardino, I believe I got that right. The other three are all at San Diego State. Sorry about that, John. Um, and I love this work um, because I think it's so timely at this point in history. And so what they talk about is and point out is that all of our categories, right, and distinctions we use, our social categories, are definitely more socially constructed than they are biological facts or realities. So even around sex and gender, and yes, there are, is some biology there, but most of how we experience it, how we story it, how we create our identities around it um, are, are social constructs. And so you can look at every culture in the world um, and how they might define male versus female versus other forms of gender um, or gender forms of gender identity are very, very different. And so these are very much socially constructed concepts that we often take um, to be facts and realities that are inescapable, but they have evolved uh, very differently in each culture. You can see this um, throughout history. And one of the things they point out, and I think, like I said, this is so timely, um, is that you know, human, human brains, we are wired to notice differences. And the brain is doing this to label what's dangerous and what's not dangerous, what's safe, what's dangerous. It's like the fundamental thing the brain is doing is keeping us safe. That's, <laughs> and we have the whole stress response. We have an amygdala trying to keep us safe. And so we're noticed and we're wired to just notice difference. That's just how we are wired. And it comes out of a need for safety. Is this, you know, is this situation animal person safe, right? Or not? And so even when we aspire to be unbiased, there are all these unconscious processes, you know, that keep us, that, that create biases. And we're not even conscious of most of them. And that is why it is this life long journey of reflecting and listening to others' experiences to, and reflecting on our own to constantly kind of deconstruct some of our biases, becoming aware of them, it's a lifelong journey. We're never all going to be done. Um, but that our tendency is kind of to, to see an us versus them. And, and so what they talk about is this themifying or othering is also how it has been called, is really the source of how we dehumanize other. Because before you can be cruel to another, you have to themify, you have to other them. And you see this in the 18th century Europeans and colonialism, 
where they met native people and they were so different, they were, they dehumanized them in their mind. And that was the first step that, that had to happen for the acts of cruelty that followed. And, and so all of us are capable of this, not just 18th century European explorers, um, all of us are capable of this. And if you think you're not, you probably <laughs> need to reflect on that because all of us do this to some extent. In terms of creating our culture, we kind of, our identities, we lean into our cultural identities, which means we have to separate from others to just form that. But then the trick is being able to remain flexible enough in our own thinking and in our own storing of our own identity to resist othering. And there's a certain amount of that that does happen and it's being able to stay in dialogue with both sides without slipping into, I would say, a fairly natural human tendency to dehumanize, because you see that in all cultures around the world throughout history. But it's this polarization, this tribal affiliation, which can feel really good. I mean, you can just look at how people cheer for their home football or soccer teams, right? <laughs> That's a tribal affiliation, folks. Um, and so... So as we get polarized, if we allow this to stay in this um, polarized distinction of self versus other, a familiar versus different, um, you really shrink the humanity of that other person to this one variable. And you can see this happen around gender, gender identity, race, ethnicity, religion. Humans have done this, you know, around ability, you know, social class. It has happened throughout history in all cultures, we're all capable of it. And it really takes a dedication to finding, to, to staying connected with elements, um, uh, to be able to see the hum full humanity of that person rather than boiling them down to this one characteristic. And uh, Monk and colleagues uh, talk about what they call interculturalism, which is a reflective relational process. So rather than kind of positing these universal characteristics into these groups, kind of assuming that there is this ongoing um, process that affirms the difference, uh, honors that difference, is curious about it, and also knowing that there, there are many different dimensions of um, humanity, even with someone who looks so different from you, I promise you, if you stay in if you have a conversation with them about their experiences, even around some of these experiences of difference, you will find that, that you have other dimensions of humanity where you connect. Um, and, and they also, as part of interculturalism, is realizing that these differences need to be valued uh, and prized because they're a requirement for creating um, anything new and different. And, you know, I will just share here um, how important I personally think it is to develop friendships with people who experience the world, see the world very differently than you do. And um, I will I will admit <laughs> I got into them, themifying in U.S. politics for uh, a, a period. And um, I was sitting there one day with somebody and I was talking with them. And I realized, right, that, oh my God, they're on the different end of the political spectrum than I was. <laughs> and I, really there was everything I wanted to do was to bolt and leave. And I couldn't, I was in a social situation where I just couldn't graciously end the conversation. And I said, so, oh my God, what am I gonna do to hear Diane? And I said, you know what? Let's just get curious. Let's just listen. And as I sat down and I asked this person, you know, where did, you know, what are their thoughts on this? And where did that idea come from? You know, what I learned is they had this whole experience of childhood trauma that made their current position make sense. And I realized, even though I assumed we were on totally opposite teams, totally different opinions, right? I realized like on about 80% of these, you know, political positions, we were more similar than different. And I left that conversation humbled. Um, I left that conversation seeing this other person as more fully human, 
I saw myself as more fully human. I had so much more hope for humanity, for my country, because I will tell you, there are moments I haven't had a lot of hope for my country in the last decade. Um, and I mean, my psychologically, I was in a much healthier place than when I was so strongly sure about what I thought I knew, what I thought my political side knew, and all of that. And so I share this with you. Um, this is one of the reasons I thought it was so important to include um, these concepts in the book, because this tendency to polarize, especially what's happening politically in the United States, we have this two-party system where, oh my God, we are like polarized on every single issue. It is so unhealthy for us as a country that it really starts with us being willing to sit down and talk with those who see the world differently than we do, or at least vote differently than we do, to understand where they're coming from. And it rekindles the humanity in each of us. And it is such a powerful experience. So where you can, when you can, I invite you to have these conversations. Um, I hope you have a similar experience to mine in terms of being able to understand these differences, whatever dimension of humanity it might be at the moment um, from a new lens. Okay, moving on to critical social theories. So um, critical social theories, critical theory um, is a, a set of theories that really seek to both identify as well as challenge social inequities between groups um, that are created by systemic forms of oppression. And so this certainly is a hot button topic uh, politically in the United States uh, right now. And the social uh, critical social theories um, talk a lot about decolonizing practices. Um, we are liberating um, clients from um, histories of, of various forms of colonization by reconnecting them typically to their native culture, their home culture, you know, um, their, eth their ethnic or racial identities. And the critical race theory specifically posits that there is no genetic basis for race, that race typically is organizing, most society is organizing society, and that um, is from these theories that we get the concept of white privilege as well as systemic racism. And this is pervasive in societies like the United States in particular, um, societies where there was colonization. But you can also see various forms of this, I think, in, in many different cultures around the globe. And so the, um, the focus here really is to give voice to the marginalized, to understand their experiences, because what we know is in any society, any culture, I guess this is actually in chapter two, now chapter three, the work of John Schotter, culture, uh, John Schotter is a social constructionist, uh, kind of works more in the philosophy than therapy realms. He says, you know, cultures are a set of goods and shoulds that a, a group of people agree to organize um, joint action. And so there, there needs to be a symbol for, I am your friend, I am not gonna hurt you, and a symbol for, which you know is off the handshake, right? Uh, there needs to be ways of coordinating, you know, is, am I a safe person or are we going to go to war with each other? You know, how do we coordinate action? What's an appropriate distance to stand next to each other? You know, that, that varies dramatically across cultures, right? It's been measured and studied. Um, but to, co to coordinate action, we need to have a set of, you know, what's good and what's not good. And so any every culture has to, in order to coordinate meaning, has to marginalize and oppress certain behaviors. And, and so, but the measure, so if that's happening to some extent in every culture, um, the, every culture has within it a certain amount of oppressing certain behaviors. And oftentimes those get, you know, attributed to certain types of people. But the key to identifying what is an opp oppressive society versus one um that is able to remain humane is the degree to which marginalized voices are allowed to be heard. And so this is so important, 
both at the societal level, but this is a workshop about doing psychotherapy. So even at the individual level, within couples, within families, that having these marginalized voices be heard, be brought into the room is essential um, for creating a humane relational process. And so that giving voice to marginalization and marginalized voices, it is not always comfortable. It is not always easy. Um, that, but that is the um, key process to help with dealing with systemic forms of oppression. There has to be a feedback loop that allows those marginalized voices to be heard and allow those to influence the broader system. And I, you know, I don't think there's ever going to be this perfectly enlightened, you know, I don't know, culture where everyone's voice is equally heard at all times in all ways. We still have to coordinate, you know, behaviors, but we are going to be more humane the more we can allow um, these marginalized voices to be heard. And then finally, uh, critical theories um, really in terms of the world of, of psychotherapy, invites us to look at our own biases as clinicians and doing the work to identify those. Um, and, and those come to us from our family of origins, from our own social location, from the, you know, from the communities that we are a part of. None of us are immune to this bias. And all you can do is continually work to identify those biases. Um, but it is an ongoing process and that is why giving a voice to the marginalized is so critical in helping to address so many of the systemic forms of oppression um, that we see in the world today and that our clients are affected by in the world today. Okay. So moving on here, we're gonna talk about relational responsiveness. And so this um, comes from the work of Saliha Bhava. It is grounded in social constructionism, collaborative dialogue processes, and what I love about um, Sally Howe's work is this emphasis of power with versus power over. And so much of the research and literature around social justice, and the, I would say the field of psychology, mental health counseling, really focuses on who power over. And most of the time when you hear power talked about, it is about who's got power, who's got not. Who you know is always assuming a hierarchy. And what Saliha is saying, coming from a social constructionist perspective, a collaborative dialogic perspective, is how do we shift from the therapist, especially this is I, I would well, one of the angles it came from. There's so many different layers of this. How do we shift though from models of power over to models of power with? And so realizing, especially when we are the ones in the room as the clinician with the most power, right? How do we use that to move from power over to a power with, to shared power? Um, and that there really is a social construction even of power and this interconnection and how we are interdependent with one another. And she points out that all injustice always occurs within relationships. And it is produced, so injustice is both produced and maintained through our actions and through our words. And the way we talk with our clients, the way we even talk about power in particular, affects how power is perceived and wielded in the room, including the therapy room, and then also in our clients' lives outside of our therapy room. So this is kind of opening us up, I think, to think about power in different ways, especially when we're the ones with power. <laughs> How are we wielding it? How are we using our power in the room? And can we shift from a power over, which never feels good, <laughs> to a power with way of using it, um, our, our position in the room? And um, Bava talks about this relational discursive loop and I, there's an illustration for this on the next slide, but first I'm going to define for you all the different parts that she talks about the, the four mutually influencing relational forms of interaction. They're almost like infinity loops. Um, and the first is that when you're um, making meaning that there are these biological, somatic, and sensory experiences that we have. And these are connected to our words and our interactions. These are the building blocks for making meaning with others. 
And these create, these meanings get strung together to create the stories and the frame for interpreting what is going on. So all of our utterances and interactions are interpreted um, from meanings that we give them within relationship. And then finally, we have those larger societal social structures that, um, that shape our our meanings, right? So these large, how all of our experiences fit into the broader social context affects the meanings we're able to create. So when you put all this together, this is the what she calls the relational discursive um, loop. All of these are interconnected, moving together. You have your, you know, the somatic experiences that are connected to your utterances that in, you know, in our interactions, and we pull these meanings together to create stories and frameworks that are informed by the social systems, which come back and affect our stories and frames. They inform what we say and how we interact and that we can feel that in our bodies. And so from the societal level down to the cellular level, our meanings, our interactions, that we are creating these meanings together. And when she talks of this concept of relational responsiveness, there's an emphasis on the fluidity of meaning. And this is really coming from a social constructionist approach. And you'll see different of these, some of these models lean more into the social constructionist, some lean more into critical theories. And so here it's looking at how each one of us uses our words uh, to create meaning within our various social structures and that it's constantly fluid and evolving. That's why I said, you know, terms that we use 10 years ago were not accepted today. I don't expect them to be accepted in 10 years from now, right? How you identified 10 years ago is probably not how you identify today, probably not going to be how you identify. And even if you keep the same label on it, let's just say I identify as a woman, right? How I understood that 10 years ago, how I story that and make sense of it today, and how I story and make sense of it in 10 years from now, even if the same word is used, it's going to be very, very different. And so there's this constant fluidity of what, um, how these words mean, how meaning is made, and it is going from the highest levels of our social societal structures, you know, to this frames and stories, our identity narratives, to the words and our interactions with others, and we feel that in our body. And so that all of these meanings are inherently fluid, inherently evolving, and like I said, especially with this chapter, I expect when I have to update it and whatever, eight years from now, you know, many of the terms will either be totally replaced or totally redefined, especially in this area when we're looking at social justice, um, dominant discourses, and our identities. The emphasis here really is on democratizing knowledge and what things mean. Um, and so looking at how you with your client are creating meaning, being very intentional about how you are creating meanings and interpretations and how these fit into the broader social context. And so I have had so many clients um, tell me I'm like the only person I can talk about my gender identity or my sexual orientation or my these the racial dynamics as they experience them you know whatever because oftentimes in our society there's so many rules about what you can say and you can't say and they're so afraid of offending people there's there's no place to like have this conversation and, and this can happen even within marginalized communities um I have several of my clients identify with the LGBTQ community and they say, I can't even say these things, talk about my identity even more because it has become so polarized and politicized even within their you know, community. I have folks from you know, various ethnic communities, you know, I can't say this, I can't say that, I can't say it. So, you know, at the very least, I think in, the, in their relationship with us, you know, can we meet them where they're at, share power with in terms of how we interpret these larger social structures, how we I, narrate our identities, how we experience things with side by side with our clients to allow there to be a fluidity of what these words and labels might mean to them. And it really is, I mean, it's a privilege, I think, to be so intimately invited into someone's experience and it is such um 
I don't, it is such a, it's such a privilege and a huge responsibility to have those conversations in ways that really lift up and move our clients um, in ways that really help them find their own sense of agency, help them find an identity that is true to them and meaningful to them and allows them to move forward in their lives in ways that are empowering and uplifting, um, you know, within the shells of context that they still must continue to work in. And it is such important work for us to do. It is privileged work. It's a huge responsibility and it requires a lot of curiosity and openness and you know as you do this you'll get much better you will not be perfect you know every utterance we have does come from our own framework we're always revealing our own social uh, version of reality our own constructions of reality and so there is this art i think you get better as people correct you over the years of doing this um but you know if, if they can sense your humility and your openness you can have some of the most incredible conversations um, with our clients around these areas. So, and that's what this whole concept of relational responsiveness is, is realizing that you are in the moment, second by second, our words, our actions are shaped and informed by what is happening with our clients. And it, this requires being comfortable with a very high level of uncertainty, not knowing um, being open, being willing to um, have all of your assumptions reorganized, deconstructed, um, and your worldview um, expanded. Okay, so moving on, we're going to talk about global family therapy um, and the systemic inclusive framework. Um, this is the work of Muditha Rastogi, and go ahead here. So, um, so uh, Mudita is really inviting us to take, I think, the largest system view out there, um, which is a very global perspective when we're working with our clients and, and identifying all the different systems that our clients are embedded within and then bringing that down to really practical action listening to their fee feedback um, to improve what you, what you do here. And you can see here, um, she uses a three, a three, a four level um, framework that starts at what's called the pan-cultural level, which is looking at our worldviews, beliefs about health, suffering, and seeking help. So these are very broad level uh, cultural discourses. Then moving to the contextual level, which is looking at what are the current events and what's going on, what's the historical, what's power, privilege, local community context for the clients that we are working with. Then looking at intersectionality, so looking at the client's social location and how all of those dimensions come together in this one person who is sitting before us. And then looking um, at the inter um, integrational, which is the individual differences, family dynamics, you know, medical and personal needs. So looking at how all of these um, dynamics are at play in our clients' lived realities. And so, um, and so really looking in terms of applying this, at the, there's a really recursive process here, and we saw this in the last model as well, of um, assessment, intervention, feedback from the client about what we did, and then, you know, going back to improve how we move forward, how we understand, how we assess, adjusting our assessments, trying to intervene, getting client feedback, and constantly taking in and adjusting um, uh, how our clients are experiencing what we do for them. And in terms of the systemic inclusive framework, um, we just had that bullet point over there, but looking um, particularly um, at national identity uh, in, in addition to other forms of diversity, but can then considering the legal, the political, the educational institutions, um, especially when you're working with clients who may be immigrants or there's, you know, first or second generation in whatever country you are working in at the time, because I know this, we've got an international audience here. Um, but considering all of these layers, and you typically have to ask to find out about your client's unique experience um, related to these dimensions. 
And then also looking at global mental health. So taking a global perspective. Uh, Mudita is inviting us to take a global perspective of our work um, and considering the dynamics of war and mass trauma, migration, displaced populations, uh, just even looking what's happening in Ukraine and how that is affecting the entire world, but especially the regions near, near them. And, and as, you know, looking at migration and as we look at climate change, you're expecting more um, shifts in all of these patterns. Um, and I'm really avoiding kind of an imperialist uh, approach or assumptions in uh, how the world should be, who should be doing what, what's healthy, what's not healthy. And really um, meeting our clients where they're at, understanding all of these layers of experience and how they are affecting them in this moment, in this current context that they are in, and how to harness with the resources in this current context to address, you know, not just maybe the presenting issue, but understanding all the rings of context around that so that we really have a meaningful way of engaging with our clients. Um, especially in today's very global society that we live in. So moving on, I know I told you it's a whirlwind tour here. Uh, we're going to talk about just therapy and working with Indigenous, Native, and Aboriginal communities. So it's really interesting in family therapy, getting back to Bateson and um, one of his mentees, Brad Keeney. Um, there is this real anthropological foundation um, both Bates and Ann Keeney work quite a bit with indigenous um, populations. But what's interesting within the field of family therapy, we don't have any specific approach that, that has actually been developed, I think, in, in a meaningful way. I, I think the one we have um, that has been most, I think, developed or well-developed or clearly developed, I guess is a better way to say that, is um, the work of Charles Waldegrave and Kiwi uh, Tamas, Tamasi. Um, which is just therapy, and they are in New Zealand, and they developed an approach um, for working with many of the native po um, populations there, and they identified three key elements, and I think you will see this in some of the other, throughout my book, you'll see there's always a um, section on applications, and you see this in all the work with indigenous and native communities, uh, many of these um, themes here. And the first is the theme of belongingness, um, both of cr creating and understanding um, a sense of belongingness to a, their community is very important. And how do you nurture? How do you foster that? Um, another element here is the concept of sacredness of human life. And so honoring um, the sacredness of life, relationship to life, and I guess it's coming on the next slide. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but this is certainly a theme. And I think when you're working with Indigenous, Native, and Aboriginal communities, their understanding, their relationship to life, God, the planet, is, is very different than you would see typically in, in industrialized um, nations. And so needing to step back as a clinician to understand a whole different way of relating the life, the universe, um, see, and seeing the world, it's like this whole other dimension opens up that's beyond just the local community. It's this relationship to life. And then talking about liberation in terms of reclaiming um, cultural identity, narratives, ways of being. Um, and to, in that process, there is um, a sense of liberation, agency, autonomy, which you will see that theme um, in several of the models here today. So um, there is evolving work here. Um, recently, uh, there is this work coming out of, again, the collaborative dialogic social constructionist work um, of my colleagues who work with mine communities in Mexico. And they talk about using ancestral knowledge. And so, um, and so Rocio and Papusa, they talk about, they use the concept of ancestral knowledge um, because they find that it invites all forms of knowledge and practices, both indigenous and allowing clients to draw from all of their ancestral family knowledges, which can be indigenous plus other traditions. And they found that it invites 
wanting to invite in all of the voices because many people from indigenous backgrounds you know, may choose to live in a more contemporary industrialized society. And so how do you put all of those narratives together? How is your client putting those narratives together? Um, and many times their families have both indigenous, you know, and other cultural ethnic backgrounds. And so how are they pulling those, inviting all of those voices rather than a very polarized? They found that in their work that was very important. And that's why they use the term ancestral versus indigenous or, or native. And in their work, uh, which I, again is another theme you will see in folks who work with indigenous, I just said we're not talking about that, but working with indigenous native um, communities is this concept of harmony. And they talk about how this harmony happens with their community and the environment and the culture. There's harmony is kind of the the definition or the touch point, the, the, the pulse of wellness. And so there, there, there is this harmony um, that they are seeking in, um, that they're trying to cultivate with their community, with themselves, with their families, with the larger society. That harmony is typically one of the, um, the definitions and kind of the guiding light um, and, and kind of where the, the therapy would be moving them towards. Similarly, if you look at some of the emerging work with Native Hawaiians, um, that wellness and healing, again, is very much determined, defined in terms of unity and harmony between themselves, the elders, their ancestors, the land, traditional knowledge. And again, it is seeking this sense of harmony between many levels of system, including natural systems, God, um, the planet, that there is this... Um, desire for harmony and importance in harmony. And, and, and that is not just social harmony, it is harmony with God, the planet, you know, nature, weather, all of that, there's this harmony that is of value and is part of um, how they experience and define um, wellness. And then finally, um, I'll just throw in here, because um, I've had several people comment on this. Uh, several years ago, I developed a mindful, a Buddhist informed, mindfulness informed approach for couple and family therapy. And what I added to that, which actually came out of Buddhist traditions, which isn't necessarily native, was this concept of three basic relationships with self, with others, and then with God, life, um, or the planet can be another way to experience that. And I think when working with um, with clients who identify with native um, traditions in terms of their identity to make sure that it's not just, you know, the, there's the self, there's their relationships, which can be their community. There's this whole other relationship. And you can see this also in people who are very, you know, religious, the relationship with God, a relationship with the planet um, that is another level of harmony and relationship that needs to be attended to, not just relationship with self and others, but also with much larger systems that can be literally nature or God, either one. But there's this other level of system and identity that can be very important when working with these populations. So let's continue um, looking and addressing social cultural oppression and trauma. So this model is based on the work of uh, Kenneth Hardy, who has been one of the most prolific authors, I think, in social justice in the field of family therapy specifically. Uh, and in his model of social just um, social cultural oppression and trauma, he identifies two forms of oppression that we should be aware of. First is what would be called the primary level of oppression, which is um, looking at a systematic subjugation um, you know, a, a, of a group or an individual. And so this is the obvious kind of oppression that is happening to a group. It's systematic within a given culture. And of course, across different cultures, different groups can be marginalized. But then there's a secondary level he talks about um, that is this internalized hatred um, by the person who is who is oppressed. So what happens is, when you live in a society where you are 
consistently, systematically marginalized and oppressed, um, that there's a secondary level of oppression that you start taking in the dominant discourses, the about you know what success, what beauty looks like, what family looks like, who you should be, what you should look like. You take in all of that. Um, and that then is a secondary level. You have the primary level that's coming from the outside to the individual, but then you have what the individual does to themselves because they've internalized um, some of these uh, discourses and they um, then are you know self-sabotaging themselves, there's self-subjugation, there is hating themselves, and there's this other level that needs to be addressed. And certainly when someone is coming to therapy who is um, oppressed within the culture that they are living in, it's real important for us to be aware of both forms of these oppressions. And then um, Hardy also talks about oppressions in visible wounds, um, which is just, there's some, there's obvious oppression that can happen where someone is, you know, attacked, even murdered. And sadly, we see this far too often um, in the last several years. And so that's the obvious level that we can see. And if you look at George Floyd, you know, most of the world agrees on, you know, the obvious level. But then there's a much more subtle level where there is this devalu devaluation and microaggressions, which are the subtle little things that happen every day at work. They aren't big enough that someone's going to get written up usually or disciplined. And it's often impossible to really comment because half of it may have been nonverbal. But this is constant, subtle signals that you are not enough, that you are not as good as. And these, um, so this is a, a very subtle level of oppression. It's not as obvious and often not as named. And sometimes our clients aren't even, aren't even fully aware of it and, and may not be even be able to name it. And so that's a place where we can help them in identifying this. And it can be so powerful to talk about those moments with our clients in a way that we name it and we see it the way they do. And I cannot tell you how healing this can be um, for our clients to be able to name it, um, identify it, and I label it for what it is. Um, another thing that can happen is when you have been oppressed um, within your society is that you just learn to be silent. You he, uh, he calls it learned voicelessness. Um, so that is just, th there's no point in speaking up. You'll never be heard. You'll never be appreciated. It's just safest. All about brains, all about safety. Going back to that, it's safest to be silent. It's safest to say nothing. Um, and learning that your voice doesn't count. And so there is this learned powerlessness and voicelessness um, that creates just incredible. It's an incredible, the psychological impact of that cannot be overstated. And then, after all of that silence and stuffing and microaggressions you cannot comment on without being punished, um, you can also see rage. And so that's perfectly normal when you've experienced systematic lifelong oppression to experience rage from the extreme sense of powerlessness that you experience. And so um, that's just some another place where if we can give voice to that to allow that rage to be expressed um, and allow, I think, to be witness to the injustice, it can be incredibly powerful because, you know, regardless of whether you're similar or different to your client in whatever dimension they're experiencing the oppression, being witness to that can be incredibly healing to our clients. If you can witness that injustice, um, validate their experience, um, it's incredibly powerful because you are also a person in that room, in that moment, you are a person who is in a, in a level of power and to have it, their experience of oppression, trauma, and injustice witnessed by anyone in power 
is um, a very important thing that we can give our clients to help with healing. So there's also been work done here specifically on the residual effects of slavery. And so Wilkins and her colleagues have put out two articles um, related to the residual effects of slavery. And they talk about post-traumatic slave syndrome, which is this intergenerational trauma. So family therapists noticing that there is this intergenerational effects of trauma, including what they call post-traumatic slave syndrome, where there's this lower sense of self-esteem, anger, and rage, and really just a socialization to, be, to racism throughout um, through um, this intergenerational process. Specifically, they talk about slavery's effects, both on the individual as well as the family, and that at the individual level, what you can see is a mix of both rage um, as well as passivity. And from the intergenerational effects of slavery, you have learned you had to be passive to survive, and yet there was a lot of rage that had to be suppressed for the incredible amount of injustice that was being suffered. So you can have this juxtaposition of um, rage and passivity. And then at the family uh, dynamic level is that you will see that there is this socialization um, from parents to children to help them navigate the very real dangers of racism. And, and so the, this is part of the intergenerational legacy um, of, of slavery, of living in a place this they are speaking specifically of the United States. I, I don't know how well this translates to other parts of the world, um, but specifically in the United States, having to navigate um, um, racism in a society that had slavery not so long ago. If you think of it, I think it's just five, six generations. It's not that long ago. Um, and so looking then at what they call African-American resilience, both at the individual level as well as the family level, and really as family therapists cultivating um, and prioritizing those community connections, which um, is part of the resilience that has come out of um, this intergenerational pattern, as well as um, understanding cultural narratives and its effects on a person or families or couples, fundamental assumptions about life, who they are, what their value is um, in this society, and understanding how these legacies affect, you know, the clients that you are working with. And so being aware of these dynamics that are very real in a place like the United States um, and around the globe, you know, anyone, if you're working in, in, in you know, looking at the communities, um, there are many communities that have been painfully marginalized um, around the globe and understanding these intergenerational effects. It's not like, you know, oh, you know, whatever, X, Y, Z happened in the case of the United States, you know, we ended the Civil War, ended slavery. It's not like it was all done and everything was all better and went back, you know, and all of a sudden everything, all the problems are gone. There are, you know, especially the way it was handled in the United States where there wasn't um, anything done to really help um, former slaves integrate into successfully and equally into society. Um, we have very painful legacies that we need to deal with this in, in this country. And just being aware and mindful of that as you're working with clients can be a very important part of helping with healing and moving forward. Next here, we have liberation-based healing perspectives. And um, this is the work of Rhea Almeida. And uh, this uh, she draws uh, quite a bit on critical um, theories we've been talking about, looking at power, privilege, and oppression, and how that is playing out in our clients' lives. And she recontextualizing whatever our clients are going through, through this broader matrix of power, privilege, and oppression. So um, in terms of liberation-based uh, praxis, developing critical consciousness, so being able to look at how the systems um, in our society 
um, favor some and not others, how there is systemic uh, oppression and racism and um, various isms of, of various forms. Um, and really, so identifying these dynamics, being able to uh, then promote empowerment in our clients and creating accountability for one's own actions. And then the four principles here are transparency and the naming of hierarchical structures. So um, identifying racism, sexism, heterosexism um, that our clients are experiencing in their lives, how it's directly impacting them, trying to disrupt the hierarchical categories of, of uh, coloniality. So, you know, privileging white, privileging heterosexual, um, privileging upper social classes, uh, that sort of thing. Um, epistemistic, uh, epistemistic di disobedience. So being willing to counter some of those dominant discourses around age, race, gender, um, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, social class, religion, and this um, desegre desegregating and redrawing boundaries of inclusion and to create spaces um, where people are able to feel included because psychologically feeling a part is, is, is critical and having places in our communities in our life where we feel a part of something is um, a very critical element for our own mental health. There's so much research that talks about how important being a part of feeling connected to a community, having relationships where we feel connected is one of the most important parts, um, things necessary for us to experience a sense of mental health. And uh, they talk about having healing circles where spaces where people can safely discuss their um, experiences of oppression to reflect on them, deconstruct them. And so that from there they can um, construct more empowering identities, see new possibilities and construct a life um, that truly is liberating to go back to the title. So gender and power in family therapy. I told you we've got a lot to cover here. Um, so egalitarian relationships um, actually do bring a sense of personal well-being and satisfaction, a greater sense of personal well-being and satisfaction for both men and women when compared to um, more traditional hierarchical um, relationships. That said, we cannot force all of our clients to want to have an egalitarian relationship. I think that's an important thing to realize, but most clients, um, at least in the United States, most couples will say they do want more of an egalitarian relationship, even if their actions may not match up with that, which typically they don't, to be quite honest. Um, but most of them want that. And in most cases, that is that is associated with a greater sense of um, health and well-being. Um, I, I think when you're working with couples and families that there are so many gendered cultural norms on how to be a couple, how to be a family, um, that most of us often, again, it's a very unconscious roles we play out, assumptions we have, who does what, how much did each person do, that sort of thing. Um, and, and that even in some of the same sex couples I've worked with, these, these gender discourses can be so powerful. I've even seen it in some cases in, um, you know, non-traditional types of couples in even same sex couples. And so most therapists unintentionally, we do not mean to, um, actually reinforce many gender stereotypes. One is that men's needs are privileged. And oftentimes their voices, their needs, their agenda um, gets prioritized. And, you know, researchers have analyzed, you know, um, transcripts and videos of various therapists who would say, I, you know, I strive for equality, try to create equality. But when you actually, you know, analyze what goes on in a session, there's this very subtle um, deference typically um, to men's needs and voice. In general, we will, therapists will unintentionally expect women to be more responsible for the relationship. Women tend to be, I always tell them they're forced, socialized, you know, to be more empathetic, to be more understanding, to be accommodating. And so it's generally easier 
I'm just saying, if you do couples therapy, it's generally easier to get the female or more feminine um, partner to take more action to create relationship change. And we, it's not conscious. We're not doing it intentionally. You can just feel like who's going to go home and do their homework. And so you tend to lean in that direction. And you'll also see that women tend to be, uh, or therapists might reinforce women protecting men from shame, from stress. Um, and that there's just very unequal expectations around childcare, house, um, house maintenance, that sort of thing that we still know today in the United States, even though people will say that they have an egalitarian relationship, um, there is a measurable difference in the, um, not only the hours women would put, will put into childcare and household chores, but also kind of the um, invisible burden of just worrying about and managing the emotions of the family, making sure birthdays and holidays and all that stuff and, you know, communicating between warring factions in the family, right? Um, uh, that there's this whole kind of invisible level of burden that many women take on, whether consciously or unconsciously, and that many therapists unconsciously kind of, yeah, that's what women do, right? And it really takes discipline to train yourself to not fall into that pattern. So, um, and then also you will see, like I've mentioned before in chapter nine of the fourth edition in the intergenerational chapter, we uh, introduced the women's project, which was the first group of family therapists to really take on looking at gender dynamics. And then we have in chapter 12, uh, social emotional relationship therapy with um, Carmen Knudsen and her colleagues that has a, I would, a more postmodern, that's why it's in that chapter, <laughs> contemporary approach to working with uh, gender dynamics in couples. That is, it, it is a, I, I love this model because it, it's a very, it invites the couple to reflect on. It's a very gentle, it's not a, um, it's not a shaming type of process, but really inviting uh, couples to look at those um, dynamics. Then looking at LGBTQ, IA plus affirmative therapy within the field of family therapy, the affirmative therapy, LGBTQ, IA plus affirmative therapy is a, certainly a, a mainstream um, kind of uh, counseling approach. Um, but, and within family therapy, we have our own folks who are working on this approach. And so Again, recognize the philosophical foundations of this framework is, uh, begins with recognizing power, privilege, and oppression, and then recognizing also the importance of the therapist to do their own self-reflection um, and, and to be activists and to support clients and support social change. But um, looking at our own gender, sexual orientation, um, gender identity narratives that we have, um, and how that impacts the work we do with our clients. One of the biggest areas I would say fam where family therapists um, are pivotal um, is working with family acceptance, working with clients, LGBTQ clients coming out to their families um, and facilitating family acceptance. And we know that one of the most important things is having a family being accepting um, of our clients' um, identity and, and coming out and to have that support in the coming out process. It can be a complex um, process. I think in various chapters, you will see I have summarized article and models for supporting uh, um, gay lesbian clients coming out, bisexual clients coming out, transgender clients coming out to their families. There are some existing models. I think you're going to find most of them. Ooh, in the, uh, chapter six with systemic therapy, chapter seven structural, I think has uh, some too, um, but that's certainly an area of specialty that one can develop as a family therapist that is just critical. And again, as self of the therapist, kind of an ongoing process of self-reflection, acknowledging um, where you ha may have privilege and, ident and looking at how your identity has evolved and developed um, over time. And as I mentioned earlier, I mean, constantly our gender, sexual identities 
are evolving, you know, even if you keep the same label, which not everyone does over the course of their life, even if you keep the same label and quote unquote identity, the story you tell yourself, what that means, how that works, how that looks, um, is going to evolve even over your own life. And so being reflecting on that is an important part of being able to work with LGBTQ um, clients. And then finally, the importance of intentionally communi communicating an LGBTQ affirmative stance on your consent, consent forms, websites, you know, asking for pronouns and the paperwork, even the artwork and what, you know, in your bathrooms, there are lots of ways that you can communicate um, your affirmative stance so clients know that they're safe coming to you. And so in the book, I have this chart that just has some of the key vocabulary. I, I also teach a laughter way to licensure course where people have asked me for those vocabulary terms. So I'm making sure that it is in this uh, workshop that will be um, made freely available on the internet. So, uh, so these are just some of the key terms and vocabulary. So sexual minority is any sexual orientation that differs from the dominant group, typically heterosexual in most cultures. Uh, marginalized sexualities is any sexual form of sexuality that that is socially oppressed or subordinated. Queer um, was once a derogatory label. Like I said, these, these terms can change over and evolve over time. So at one time, queer was really a derogatory label that was reclaimed by the LGBT, now Q, um, communities, and it is used to describe both fluidity of gender and sexuality. So it's a pretty general, broad term. Polyamory is having multiple romantic sexual relationships with the consent of all involved. So that is, um, that is the key element there. So looking at these other terms real quickly, I'm gonna go through this super quick. Um, sex is biologically defined based on hormones, uh, chromosomes and sex characteristics. Intersex is a general term for those born with both male and female sex characteristics. Asexual is someone who is non-sexual or has a little or no sexual feelings. Gender is a socially constructed a notion about roles, identities, um, based on masculinity, femininity, or androgyny. Non-binary is identifying neither as masculine or feminine. Agender is not identifying with any gender. Gender identity is your internal sense of gender, where gender expression is your outward ex um, uh, your outward expression of gender. Of course, it's all socially contextualized. Um, transgender is someone whose gender identity doesn't align with their uh, sex assigned at birth, where cisgender is a person whose gender identity does align with their sex assigned at birth. Um, social transition is um, for someone who is transitioning genders, where the um, disclosing the gender identity to others and asking them to honor their identity, and maybe, you know, such as using pronouns or name. A physical uh, trans, uh, transition is when you're physically representing one's gender through changes in clothes, hormones, and or surgeries. Gender affirmation surgeries are surgeries that affirm one's gender, which, um, so, and that has also, of course, been very politicized in recent years at least in the United States, I don't know about the rest of the world. Um, homophobia is an irrational fear of um, LGB, of, of gay, lesbian, gay, bisexual. I don't know why um, taking that apart from LGBTQ is hard for me. Um, sexual minority prejudice is discrimination based on sexual orientation. Bisexual erasure is denial of the existence of bisexuality and insisting that all sexuality is binary. And then transphobia is fear, hatred of people do not conform to gender norms. <sighs> I think I got through this table. Okay, we're almost at the end and I know we're almost out of time. I'm gonna keep moving forward here. So self of the therapist and, um, and the social cultural relational connection. And this is done by my colleagues, uh, Dana Stone and Jessica Chen Feng. Um, and here they're talking about how do you have these conversations um, in ways that are safe and empowering and effective. So stage one, um, of, in terms of having a social cultural relational connection is you begin with civility and trust. So establishing respect, um, 
And typically while avoiding conversations re uh, regarding social cultural issues, then once there is a basic fundamental connection and sense of uh, mutual respect, look, at that point, um, indicating social cultural int interests. So discussing social cultural contexts. Stage three is the curiosity. So relations, um, discussing the other's social cultural experiences. And so you're asking questions, being curious. Stage four is you're um, reflecting on your own personal experiences and developing new awarenesses. So like I said, when I uh, met with that one person who I discovered I was stuck in a situation with someone very different political worldview, you know, beginning with respect, you know, um, as these social cultural topics got raised, being curious, and as I learned from that other person, I definitely understood myself and just the broader social context better. And then attunement to relational power. So shifting from the content of social cultural issues to the process of how these play out in relationships. So then, you know, not just talking about awareness and curiosity, but then thinking about how do these play out between us in our relationship and how does that affect the power and the process of, of how we do Power over, power with. So kind of wrapping up here, creating a more just world. How do therapists do that? One is educating yourself. And it's a constant process. You showed up here. So anyone who's listening to this, you've got to care, I think, I'm assuming. Um, but educating yourself. And it's a constant, evolving, never-ending process. I hope you grow to love it because it, it just deepens and it's like your life becomes more multifaceted. Uh, you understand humanity in new and different ways. And so it's a constant evolving journey. You're never done. You will be humbled. It will be uncomfortable at times. Um, all I can do is encourage you that it is worth the journey. Two, cultivating um, compassionate curiosity. And that's not just when people maybe look different or you know they come from a different background, but even with people who look like you who come from more similar backgrounds, sometimes we make we have the we are the most biased and judgmental with people who we think should have our set of values and be like us. We often are the least curious, um, the least open in those cases. Um, cultivating your own sense of humility and being always being willing to take in and learn more. And finally, I would say one of the greatest challenges is being able to in, uh, help, especially working with our clients, what we're talking about here, um, identifying the social, the social injustice that our clients may be experiencing and recognizing and validating that. Uh, and to do that while at the same time being careful to not accidentally disempower them. And this is very easy to do. It's actually very hard to identify and name injustice while promoting um, also their sense of agency. And I think that's when you do this work with clients, those are the two dynamics you have to constantly move back and forth. Because if you lean too heavy into um, awareness of injustice, you can accidentally reinforce the victim identity, right? Where our real challenge is how, if you're living in a society where you are oppressed and marginalized, where can there still be moments for agency and empowerment within that? And so how do we recognize name injustice, validate that experience, while not actually reinforcing a victim identity, while still identifying where there is agency, where change can happen, where advocacy can happen, and how to balance those two dynamics um, so people can recognize and process. Often, typically, there's going to be trauma there to be processed around oppression and injustice, while at the same time, being able to see where there is agency, where they can make change, where they can find community. Um, to, to move forward in a way that is empowered and liberating. And if you look at the postmodern therapies, I've always found it very interesting that the goal is to create agency, a sense of personal agency that I am the one writing the narrative of my life. I have, I have agency in, in where my life goes. 
And that is so important for our own sense of mental and emotional and relational well-being. Continuing the conversation, I want to invite you. Um, I do have a mailing list, so many of you are on that, so you got to this. But if you have not, I, um, I do give out two free continuing educations at least per year. You can go to the therapythatworksinstitute.com. There are free forms that go with the book that you can go to therapythatworksinstitute.com backslash books, and you will get all the forms that go with this book. You can also find links if you want to buy the book there or rent the book. Um, and if you're interested in using my unifying framework, I always have a, you can join the wait list. I have a cohort starting in the fall and, uh, there will be an early bird sale where you get 25% off, but only to the secret people who are on that waiting list. And then finally for YouTube, I will be doing a, a series of, of re-recording all the videos that go with both my family therapy, as well as counseling theory textbooks. I'll be redoing my counseling theory textbook rewrite it, I think in 2025, I'll start in 2024, rewriting those books. And I'll be doing a version of this social uh, justice and counseling. Um, but you can sign up to be on the um, on that web page uh, for those recordings. And then finally, I also have a YouTube channel, eventually this a video will post there or a cleaned up version of this video will post there. And you can find me at youtube.com, I guess slash C slash Diana Gayhart PhD uh, for my YouTube channel where you'll find videos that go with all of my books. Okay, so I hope this was a um, useful introduction. And right now I'm gonna go ahead and look, uh, take some uh, Q and A's from our live audience here. Um, and so, yeah, so people are wondering how to get the slides. So for those, um, for those who have signed up for the course that goes with this, you will get all of the slides through the course itself. I do not have a way to give out slides on YouTube, but those who do join my Laughter Way to Licensure, you get all the slides for all my YouTubes in that course as well. And that is something that uh, is, is not readily uh, available uh, on YouTube. Okay. So I'm just looking for any other questions or comments um, that people may have. Okay. So, so, okay. So I'm seeing mostly gratitude here. Okay. Very good. Okay. Saying more, just really kind remarks. Thank you all for being so kind. So hopefully this inspires you all in terms of just thinking about how to bring more of a social justice perspective to your work. As you can hear, not everyone agrees on how to do this. There's no simple way to do this for everyone um, with all clients at all times. It is a constantly evolving experience for both us and our field as we learn to address these issues more meaningfully, more skillfully, more hopefully even more efficiently um, in therapy. And I think by continually educating, staying curious, staying humble, um, that you will cultivate, I think, the personal qualities needed to do this work well. <laughs>